Welcome to the Pulse of St. Louis. I'm Shirley Washington. It's that time of year again. You know the time when many of you will make New Year's resolutions. Losing unwanted pounds usually tops the list. Well, tonight we sit down with transformation coach Charles D'Angelo and some of his clients to learn strategies that help them accomplish their weight loss goals. Joining me now, Elizabeth Greer. She is a software consultant and she lost 100 pounds. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Antonia Maselli, she's a SLU law professor. She lost 160 pounds. Brian Fraley, he's a father and he lost 160 pounds. And Charles, of, cor of course, Charles D'Angelo, transformation <laughs> coach, he lost 160 pounds as a teenager and he has kept the weight off for nearly two decades. It is incredible. Wow. Your stories are all inspiring, and I am so glad you're here. Thank you for oh, being here. Uh -huh. well, Let's start you. the conversation by telling us how did you lose the weight? Elizabeth, let's start with you. I followed the plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. And what uh, was the plan? Well, the plan was um, Charles's plan, right? So you. I exercise very first thing in the morning. Yes. Which was walking. Uh, walking, Just walking. Walking on, on, on a, a treadmill. treadmill. And you s it's a gradual progression. And uh, you work your way up to 60 minutes at a specified incline and in speed. speed. Sure. That is appropriate for you. And then uh, after that, you have a shake and then three hours after that you have something else and then three hours so after that meals, mm -hmm. really disconnecting yeah. from spontaneity ultimately. exactly mm -hmm. exactly mm -hmm. and that was what was good for me because I didn't want to think about it I travel with my job so I did this process while I was on the road so and the first portion of it I drove I was driving yes and when I would arrive at my destination, I would check into the hotel, I would go to the grocery store, I would get my groceries, I would come back. I traveled with a George Foreman grill, an immersion <laughs> blender, <laughs> my measuring up. cup, yes. my, my measuring spoon, everything that I needed, I brought with me. And then after that, I started flying wow. to my destination. So my first trip to Bethesda, I still had my Foreman grill, my immersion blender and I, in my checked bag and fortunately I was able to find a grocery store close to the facility where I was working that where they had uh, already prepared chicken breasts and yes. they were four ounces and and then I would I would get them and I would say would you please weigh it for me to make sure that I'm really getting the amount that I needed and um, and then it was I was at this point getting a certain um, food for lunch and th they were weighing it all out for me food. all yeah. real food yeah. and yeah. what we want to make sure we focus on is every plan has its impact right? right so every single plan out there it doesn't matter what diet book you're looking at what mm -hmm. program you're looking at they all have their stories mm -hmm. but what I found as a 360 pound teenager was something was missing and everything else that was out there and so what I work with clients on isn't some specific dietetic approach mm -hmm. we're not there talking about calories or protein mm -hmm. or fats or carbs in fact mm -hmm. I would say as a percentage maybe five percent of our time is spent on actual food the real work is getting to why have we gotten ourselves into this habit of distracting ourselves mm -hmm. and consoling ourselves with the very substance, that being in this, this case, food, mm -hmm. that's complicating our life and making it very unmanageable. Mm -hmm. So it's how do you break that pattern, right? If a diet was the answer, I don't think I would have nutritionists, dietitians, and doctors that are clients. Mm -hmm. So I don't want anyone out there to think that the answer is you've got to follow some specific food plan. Yes, you have to eat healthy. And yes, you have to do some routine exercise. Mm -hmm. I think we all know that, right? Mm -hmm. So it's what is it that's going to allow us to begin to be consistent mm -hmm. and act on that knowledge? Yeah. And so mm -hmm. maybe Beth can talk about what was it for you that kind of broke you of that pattern of being so spontaneous? Um, it was the schedule. It having was just having a structure and the schedule. When with me, because I was on the road from Sunday through Thursday, I would come home Thursday night. I was only home Friday, Saturday, and I left again on Sunday. Who goes grocery shopping yes. for right. two days? Yeah. 
Yeah. And when I would get home, I would just grab. It was right. it was Spontaneity. easy. It was easy. It was whatever was convenient. Right. Yeah. And that's what I would do. And so I've learned that even when I was traveling, I could still eat well and I didn't need to be spontaneous. And I actually like having a schedule. Yeah. That works yeah. for me. It's making right. an investment yeah. in your future rather than a withdrawal from your future. Absolutely. And that's what so many of us find today is that life is so busy, right? Mm -hmm. We all have so many things pulling mm -hmm. at us. So how do we find that space in between something happening and us immediately reacting so we can actually pause and think about, is this going to actually bring me closer to my goal? And have we even stopped to define what our goals are? I think a major part of the work that everyone needs to do is stop and ask yourself a month, three, five, ten from now, where do you want to be? Yeah. And one of our first conversations in the coaching session is, where do you want to be three months from now? Where do you want to be a year from now? And if you stop and you actually just take some time and clear your head of all that and put it on paper, mm -hmm. write it down, there's magic in actually concretizing and put into paper what these things are that you want to achieve. And once you actually make it solid like that, you can then start to come up with a strategy, mm -hmm. a roadmap, if you will, mm -hmm. of how you're going to navigate yourself in getting there. So when we work together, I just put options out on the table for clients. Mm -hmm. And then we decide this is what we're going to do. And we get together every couple of weeks because accountability is a big right. part of it, right? Is mm -hmm. having a standard that you hold yourself to. And as a mom with Antonia being a mother, Beth having all sorts of professional responsibilities, Brian being a father, there's all too often this philosophy that, well, if I take care of everyone else first, then I'm really being a good person or a good mother or a good father. When in truth, it's necessary to take care of yourself first mm -hmm. and have that equity of health and energy available so you can deposit that into the lives of the people that matter most. Antonia, give me a sense of what your life was like and how you lost the weight. Well, I mean, I've got two young boys, so I have a two-year-old and a six-year-old. I work full-time. I'm doing a degree part-time. I'm, I mean, married and really involved with a lot of activities. Yes. And so life was just always busy, and we took the convenient way, whether it was meals or whatever the situation was. And so um, I think one of the things that Charles and I talked a lot about at the beginning was prioritizing myself on that list. Again, I think as a mom, it's so easy to feel bad about putting mm -hmm. yourself on your list, let alone at the top of your list. Um, and that's what it became. I mean, I wake up before my kids every morning, like an hour before my kids, which is an ungodly hour. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, I do it and I go downstairs and I'm on the treadmill and that's me time. And it's also me investing in myself first thing in the morning, um, which puts you in a different frame of mind for the rest of the day. And um, I think that that was kind of the big push for me was just saying it is okay for me to take care of myself and it pays off. I mean, I just got back from a week at Disney with my older son and I was telling Charles, um, I held on to him and lifted him and carried him through the whole parade because I could. I mean, that would never have happened before. I was able to just walk 15,000 steps, you know, after having worked out every day. Um, those were things I wouldn't have done before, and it made it such a more enjoyable experience for both of us. How much did you weigh at your heaviest, and how did that make you feel? At my heaviest, I think I was about 313 when I started with Charles. And Antonia's um, how tall? And I'm 5'2", probably on a good day. Um, and <laughs> so, I mean, I was, um, it had gotten to the point where I wasn't enjoying, I mean, I hadn't been enjoying shopping for years, but it was getting even harder to shop for clothes. Um, as your kids get older too, you don't want to be the kids, the parent that your kids are embarrassed about, you mm -hmm. know? And um, I, when we were looking for before photos, it was hard to find a before photo because I tried not to be in the photos. And if I did, it was a selfie and you could barely see my face. And or so you gotta get for that me, angle. right, getting right. that perfect <laughs> angle that magically made me look like I was 150 less, right? And so um, for me, it really was, getting myself back in the picture. And I mean, this last week we were constantly taking photos and I was happy to be in them and we were matching and it was wonderful because I wanted to be there with him. And you look fantastic. Thank yes. you very yes. much. Brian, yeah. tell me your story. How'd you I, I can relate sir? to both of their stories. Mm -hmm. You know, when you, when you put yourself first, everybody else in your life will benefit in the long run. And that's, that's why I looked at it. Um, I, my, what, drive, what drove me to, to contact Charles was I signed up for a backpacking trip with my son next summer uh, in New Mexico. And I was 114 pounds above the maximum weight requirement. And uh, for so, scouts, right? Brian? For scouts, for scouts. And so I, I, I figured I had to do something to, to get me there in and order to go with him. How much were you weighing at your heaviest? I, I was 388 the day that I started with Charles. I had no idea, 
you know, up until that point when I weighed, I just, I was afraid to get on a scale. Yeah, yeah. And then how long did it take you to lose the weight? Um, I started uh, the end of January of this year. So, and I hit my target goal in October. January of this year? That's correct. Yes. No yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I hit my target goal and then dropped another 10 after that. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. so, so tell me about your strategy and your plan. How I, did you do it? I followed the same plan. No, you know, it's a str strategic there's, there's plan. Only yeah. healthy yeah. foods. There's yeah. only so many healthy foods out there, and right. that's what I want really people to get is the accent is not on the food. So many yeah. people are totally, totally going down the wrong path, thinking they have to find the magic diet that's going to correct this. And as right. I said earlier, I think if that was the answer, we wouldn't see the people in Walmart or in the airport or on the streets that are struggling with their weight so terribly the way I once was, and all of us mm -hmm. had been. If it, a diet was enough, I don't think any of you would have found yourselves in my office. It's about mm -hmm. disconnecting from the emotional tie, or uh, shall we say bondage, that food posits in our life. And then once we've established a healthy relationship with ourselves, where ultimately this leads us to is learning to love ourselves. Mm -hmm. Starting to attend to ourselves, appreciate ourselves, accept ourselves, show affection to our body by treating our body with the respect it deserves, and then making space for also feelings. Because so many people, particularly my male clients, grew up in a world where showing vulnerability, showing emotion was something that wasn't very accepted or wasn't modeled by their father or by the world uh, around them. So in the work we do, it's okay, we're gonna systematically embrace a healthful food plan. And as I said, there's not a lot of difference in terms of what a person does when they work with me with how you eat. You eat about every three hours, low glycemic, complex carbohydrates, fruits, lean proteins, green vegetables. That's not the real focus. That's not what we put the accent on. The accent is on how do we make certain that we don't allow circumstances, our environment, peers, the pressure we feel from others, uh, our professional role to influence the way we're caring for ourselves. So you'll always hear people coming back to, well, just tell me what you ate. And again, mm -hmm. if and these three can attest to it, so many people will look at them and say, can you give me that diet? Well, hell, if that was enough, just buy my book or something. That's, mm -hmm. that's not where the, the real shift happens. The shift happens once you make space in between the use of the substance of food and yourself. So that when you've been eating every three hours, yet let's say you've had dinner in a half hour, you find yourself pacing the kitchen. Now, biologically, you know your stomach's full. But for some reason, your brain's firing, I need to feel different. And when that space is there, you start to ask yourself, why am I feeling the need to distract myself right now? And I can't tell you the number of clients, both female and male, that tell me what really they have been kind of masking with this food issue is an issue in intimacy or passion in their marital relationship. And so it makes space for them to really begin to address what caused this problem in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like the program's a Trojan horse. People come to me and they think they're there to lose weight. But what we're, what we're really going to do, of course, we're going to correct the weight issue, but we're going to want to resolve what started in the first place. And what I really care most about is that all three of you and anyone out there watching understands that this is not the finish line. This is not where a person is finished because recidivism is so high. You see, two, three years from now, studies show people that lose 10% of their body mass or more will have gained it all back. Now, I hope that not to be the case for any of you. And my process is about showing you all what's possible and then empowering you with the strategy to be able to continue. But that's going to be up to you. You get to run your life. And so once you've achieved this, you can't put a finish line on it. And that's what I want to talk about in the next segment. I Very want good. to talk about what do you do to keep the weight off because yes. you have accomplished such an incredible goal and you look gorgeous and you want to continue to look gorgeous. Mm -hmm. So we got to figure out how to do that. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. We'll exactly what they're doing to keep the weight off. We are back after this. Welcome back to the Pulse of St. Louis. Tonight we are talking about helping you achieve your weight loss goals. Look at my panel. Brian has lost 160 pounds. Antonia has lost 160 pounds. Elizabeth lost 100 pounds. Charles lost 160 pounds when he was a teenager and kept it off for more than 20 years. I mean, it's incredible. Their stories are just amazing. So of course, now the question is, how do you keep it off? How do you maintain your level of success and you don't start to blow up again? Mm -hmm. So Antonia, we were sharing your story and you were talking about being a mom mm -hmm. 
two children. Yeah. So what are you doing to keep the weight off? Well, I think it was about six months into my journey with Charles that my husband said, you know, so at what point do you have, get to stop waking up in the morning and doing the treadmill? Because he's taken on a lot in the morning so that I can go downstairs. Um, and I said, never. You know, I mean, this is my new normal. And I think that that's the big difference. When I um, went, to, went out of town last week with my family, I woke up every morning before everyone else and I still went to the gym. You know, I would never have done that before. And so I think it is... Um, doing that, but then you start, like I mean, Elizabeth said, I think you start enjoying it, and so it becomes part of your day. I, when we go on vacation, I see parts of nature that I wasn't seeing before, and um, there's something really peaceful about the early morning hours outside. <laughs> I mean, the other people you see are kind of your um, special friends that you make on these trips, and so I think that it really becomes nice, and it also just rejuvenates you, and it helps remind you every day of why you're doing this and what you're doing. I keep um, notes in my phone to read through every once in a while when I find something online that really inspires me. I put it in a note and every once in a while I'll read through them, not just on bad days, but on good days too, to remind myself um, you've always been beautiful, you know, but now you feel it. And so I think that's a big difference too, is just reminding yourself how great it feels to be where you are now and so that you don't let yourself slide because um, the clothes fit now, they're not too tight, but you want them to continue to fit, you know? <laughs> yeah. Do you journal? I don't journal. I don't. I am. I mean, for me, one of the challenges with my life was that there just wasn't time for anything. Um, and well, so we for me, time. well, I wasn't making time. That's, that's true. The big thing. But I mean, so for me, one of the things that was so nice about Charles plan on the food side of things was that I didn't think about it Takes anymore. I just took yeah. it out. I have my grocery list. I know what I get. It's just rote. And so this freed up time for other things and it freed up and it also forced me to stop making excuses. I mean, I think I'm sure back at that initial meeting, I tried coming up with reasons why I couldn't wake up early enough to do the treadmill. You know, I had one in my basement, but my kids are really early risers and it just wasn't an option. You know, that was what it was going to need to be. And now that hour of the morning isn't an evil time for me anymore. It's a good thing. And so um, it helps you just kind of progress and make it part of your everyday instead of something that is a diet. It really is a lifestyle change. You'd been hearing that for years, but it never meant anything. Thing, until you experience, um, until it. You experience mm -hmm. it and then it really is it's a different life but you like that life yeah so mm -hmm. exercising is obviously important Brian so tell right. me about your exercise routine are you much like Antonia that Just you like get up that. first yeah, thing you, in the morning first thing in the morning then you know it's done you mm -hmm. don't have to go back the days that that I may have skipped because I had some other function going on I didn't feel right I didn't feel like my day was complete because I didn't get to that that day you know, and, and I'm a coffee drinker, right? When I get up and work out, I don't have to have that cup of coffee. But if I, if I, don't, if I don't get on the treadmill, I need half a, half a cup of coffee just to get me going in the morning. You know? So how but, long are you on the treadmill every day? Uh, we've cut back a little bit. I'm doing 45 minutes now. Wow. Yeah. So uh, is it just the treadmill, or are you lifting weights, or just, are you jumping I, I rope? I do a or? little bit, but just part of the plan. The only thing that I stick with with the plan is the, is the treadmill work. The only thing I insist upon mm -hmm. while a client is making the progress towards establishing a better relationship with themselves and balancing out their weight to a place that's much more appropriate is healthy food, so eating about every three hours, and routine daily exercise. And the reason we put it to the front of the day, again, is it's so easy when we're a professional or when we're a parent or even if we're a student, maybe you're at home and you're a teenager who's struggling with your weight, you want to set your exercise up in such a way that nothing can interfere with it. So it becomes one of the most, if not the most, important times of your day. It also is something that allows for you to start to nourish yourself in a new way. Antonia was mentioning that she takes time to reflect on the things she has to be grateful for. And again, we really have to pause because each of us have a phone. And, or an iPad, and we're constantly pulled in so many different directions. When you chisel out a half hour, an hour of day, it gives you time to actually process what's going on with you in your life. And I think much of what we find is underneath such a, a fixation on substances, whether it be food or drug in our culture, is this constant merry-go-round of go, 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 and no one's really stopping to ask themselves, where are they headed? And so when you take that time out in the day and you put it the first thing you do, and I always tell clients to put their clothes near the bed because the most difficult thing about working out is getting there and making the decision to do it. So if you don't give yourself that space to say, do I feel like it? Because let me let you all on a, in on a big secret. There's not a day in the world I look forward to doing an hour on the stair mill, okay? <laughs> but every day I make it a habit. doesn't matter if I'm here or if I'm in a different country, wherever I am. And if you'll practice that habit, eventually it becomes part of your identity. So it's bigger than just a lifestyle. It becomes part of who you are. And one of the major tasks I have with each person that sits in front of me is helping them see themselves as 
uh, Beth had kind of alluded to earlier is not a fat person. You don't want to own that identity as you're a fat person because it's very difficult to change how you see yourself as. It's very easy to change what you're doing. So what I tell clients is you're a fit person. So with Brian and almost 400 pounds, I would say you're a 195 pound athlete carrying around about 205 pounds of fat. And our job is to start to feed that energy athlete both through what we consume physically, but also what we consume mentally. Taking time to actually consume the things that are gonna help you become more progress oriented, not get caught up in your story. And ultimately, the things we tell ourselves are at the root, most often, of why we're stuck. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, what <clears throat> were you telling yourself when you were at your heaviest? Yes. Great. Um, what did I, you think about yourself? I was not kind to myself. Mm -hmm. I, um, I, as Antonia said, I, you know, I didn't want to do pictures. Mm -hmm. I didn't enjoy shopping, and when I was younger, I was a clothes horse, but, which I can be now again, but <laughs> at that time, I couldn't, and, and that bothered me. Did it, you think that you couldn't do it? Was that no. one of the reasons that you didn't do it? No, I always knew I could. Mm -hmm. You had to find I, that discipline. I wasn't, was it? I wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. Which um, timing is a big part of yeah. it. I, I wasn't ready. And, and having that things, mindset, I'm glad you said that, mm -hmm. because you have to make up in your mind that you're going to do this. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I can't do that for you. Mm -hmm. Charles, as great as he is, he can't do that no. for you either. No. You have to make up in your yeah, mind absolutely. that you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. And yeah, I, think, absolutely. I think a big distinction that I had to make when I was much younger, and I would meet with a potential person that I would consider as a client. I would often break through their defenses in a really direct and strong way. And I still do. I think each of you can attest to that. But it's uh -oh. tempered in the years <laughs> since then. Because ultimately, I had to come to the realization, as all of us do, that we all want to strive to <clears throat> not blame ourselves or others for the conditions of their life but make the distinction that we are responsible for the conditions of our lives. And so the blame brings with it kind of a, a flavor of uh, self-hatred, of self-loathing, like it's your fault you're this way. And it's the opposite of what leads to personal growth and development. So what you want to do is you want to look at yourself and say, looking at myself honestly, admitting to yourself where you are, is this acceptable? Is this really where I want to be? And if the answer is no, you don't need to blame yourself for where you are because all sorts of things that can happen will derail us and often we make choices impulsively that take us to a place we never intended to be i don't think brian ever intended to weigh 400 pounds i don't think antonia ever intended to have 160 pounds of fat on her i'm sure beth didn't either but life happens right mm -hmm. so it's not what happens to us but it's how are we going to respond to those things mm -hmm. and by setting up a structured schedule with food and with exercise where you take it out of the the equation you know Food is interesting because it's one area of life and health is one area of life that people seem to think that once they get to a certain point, then they can go back to having absolutely no regard for their choices. A person doesn't say, once I earn a million dollars, I'll stop working and go spend it all. Yeah, okay? Some people, Some people do. <laughs> and look at, yes, but look at what happens to them. In other words, the area of finance, people yeah. tend to be much more conscious right. of the reality. They have to continually practice the disciplines mm -hmm. that got them there. When it comes to weight loss, and what you start the segment on is, how do people keep it off? How? Very simple. You draw a line in the sand. If I ever cross this line, I'm going to take consistent and massive action to get myself back within the range that I have defined, not that Charles or anyone else, I have defined as reasonable for me. And that goes for me or anyone else. Now, you get to a point where you're so habituated to what you do, you don't really have to check in with yourself that often. But I recommend anyone who's had the type of transformation these have to constantly monitor themselves at least once a week. And you want to do that for at least a period, I'd say, of two years. So you can kind of course correct. Because <clears throat> all the maintenance is about is simply balance. Mm -hmm. Making sure exercise is held constant. And you're 80% of the time, I'd say, making the healthiest choices that you can in any given situation. Would you all agree to that? Mm -hmm. But I think that also goes towards your question about how do you maintain is that if it had just been about the food, 
you wouldn't be able to do the maintenance because it's the developing the confidence in yourself piece that Inner you can trust. do it. Because I, I mean, I know you said that you knew you could do it. It just wasn't the right time. I didn't think I could do it. I mean, it was the right time and probably a couple months in, I knew I could do it. Um, and I remember when we had that initial meeting and Charles asked me, okay, what do you want the number to be when we're done? And I threw out a number and he said, no, 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 go lower. And I thought, oh, no way. No way do I hit that number. It's just not possible. And um, it wasn't until a couple months in that I believed I could really possibly get there. And I still had to develop that over time. And so I think that having that confidence helps you do the maintenance piece as well. Because when you have a rough day, the next morning you wake up and you say, OK, you can do this. You know how to do this. You know what you should be doing. And you re-energize yourself with it. And then I'm curious, too, was it something personal for you that made you decide I need to do something. Yeah, I mean, I think it was probably a million small things, but the big thing was I was receiving an award at work and I had bought a dress and I got my hair and makeup done and I felt okay about myself. And then I got there and I was standing on one side of the stage about to walk across to accept it. And I realized I didn't really want my family and my friends to see me walking across, even with all of that work that I had put into it. Um, and that was kind of a moment for me. I had been wanting to do it for my boys, um, but that was the moment that I think I said, okay, I need to do something like this. I tried a million diets and that's why they didn't work because they were diets. And so um, the good thing about Charles as well is as soon as you email well, or dry, yeah. like oh you email or do whatever the request information piece is, I mean, that man calls you and he calls you fast <laughs> and he sets up an appointment like in 24 right. hours. And so you don't have time to really think about it, let alone say, no, I can't fit that in my schedule. <laughs> I know. Like, um, yes, it really, he acts on it. And so, yeah. I mean, he yeah. gets you accountable yeah. from the beginning. And so you get in the door and you start making the changes. All right, yeah. I've got to take a break. Oh, that thought we'll continue the conversation when we come back. Charles will have the floor when we come back. Stay with me back in a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to the Pulse of St. Louis. Tonight we are trying to help you accomplish your goals of losing weight, if that is your desire in the new year. So I want to talk a little bit more, guys, about what's it like working with this guy? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? I might leave the set for <laughs> <laughs> No, you stay here, sir. We want to hear this. So what's it like, Brian? He's, he's intense to work with. But, that's my but that's what I needed. That's exactly I needed that. Yeah. I didn't need somebody that was going to be a softie yeah. with me. Right. I, I needed that push. It was like a drill sergeant. Right. Was he like a drill sergeant? But getting back to your previous segment, you know, when, when you you make that mindset, you know, that yeah. commitment to yourself. Mm -hmm. Once I hit that that point in my life where I knew that I was going to pick up the phone and call Charles, I was ready to do whatever he said. Mm -hmm. You know, I was ready mm -hmm. to do whatever his plan was, I was going to do because I had already made that, that mind up for, right. mm -hmm. with myself. Right. So it is a mindset. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Elizabeth, what about you? What's it like working with Charles? Um, I don't find it very, I don't uh, find it intense. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't just have one side. <laughs> no. yeah, humans are, are, are multifaceted. Exactly. When I am who the client needs me to be. Exactly. In other words, if a client needs some encouragement, I'll certainly be there for that. The goal I have is to what Antonia said earlier, which is to allow a client to develop the inner trust in themselves. Mm -hmm. If it's about Charles, mm -hmm. we're going about this in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. It's all about how can the client get from where they are, very dissatisfied and unhappy with their circumstance, to a place where they love themselves and they love their life. Now, it's also making room in life for the full range of emotion. All of us are gonna go through periods of our life that are sad. All of us are going to have feelings of anger. All of us are gonna have things that we're afraid of. And also there's gonna be times in our life that we're joyful. So I think most people get into trouble when they try to compartmentalize themselves into one way of being. And so it's funny when I have three or four clients together because it's as if they're talking to, they feel that they have met, uh, uh, I'm talking to four people that know four different people when I'm all the same guy. This guy says I'm a drill sergeant. She says I'm super warm and hospitable. This one says that I'm very reflective. It's all about the relationship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so there, there isn't one size fits all mm -hmm. in this type of work. And I think that's where people get mistaken is that they think that if they just follow this diet or this exercise plan, they can really get to where they need to be. All of us become very skillful at talking ourselves in and out of things. And so part of it is telling yourself what you need to hear, even if you don't want to hear it. And part of the art of the work I do, it's not really a science, is deciding when the time is right with each person for them to hear things that they need to hear. Uh, and sometimes it's difficult. If I ever find myself more interested in whether or not a client likes me over the results that they're getting, then that's the day I need to resign is what I, is in what I do. Because this isn't about Charles D'Angelo. This is about 
how can I help a person free themselves from where I once was? Uh, Beth was talking about my first call. Do you want to talk about that? Um, I, I had mentioned I was at a client site, had got this wild hair up my behind and thought, all right, I'm just going to check this out. It got the website and set the inquiry in. He called me right then. I was like, holy sh and so I was like, okay, so, so what he says to me is, well, I have an opening on such and such a day. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but I already have commitments on that day. He said, you're not ready. I said, excuse me? He said, you're not ready. I went, all right, let me see if I can make some adjustments to my schedule. And I did. And, and, it, and that was good because I, as I said, I knew I could do it. I needed to someone to help keep me accountable, and he does that for me. I help people keep an agreement with themselves. In other words, yeah. it's all about, again, it's, it's not about, it's not that I, I don't care if my clients enjoy the process. It's mm -hmm. that there's something bigger we're working on. And part of it is mm -hmm. being present enough and trusting the relationship enough to recognize that everything that's happening is coming from a good space. Mm -hmm. And I think that having suffered the way I did at 360 pounds, the reason I'm so responsive, as much as I possibly can be, is I know what it feels like not to have a place to turn. I know what it feels like to be 360 pounds, a size 50 inch waist, bullied, ostracized, teased, not even certain that you'll ever have a meaningful relationship because you don't have a relationship that's good with yourself. I know what that feels like and I've never lost touch with that. So this guy sitting in front of you, I've created this guy through the disciplines and the habits that I teach my clients, but it's not about a specific diet. It's about a mindset. It's about a philosophy. It's about a certain attitude. It's about taking responsibility for your life, not allowing situations, people, or circumstances to dictate the choices you're making and deciding when I tell myself I'm going to do something, I follow through. And that's what mm -hmm. all three of these people are wonderful examples of. Yeah. Have you guys, mm -hmm. go ahead. I was going to say, I mean, I honestly think I'm a rule follower. I'm an attorney. <laughs> it was a good profession for me to choose. And I, my kids will tell you I'm a rule follower. But I think that the best weeks for me were weeks when I had stumbled. Because, I mean, I would come in and have followed the plan and had lost the weight. And a couple weeks would go by like that. And we got along great. I mean, he wasn't a drill sergeant. He was happy and we were friendly. And it was when I stumbled that we had the effect of work done. I mean, that we actually talked about, well, why did you stumble? What's going on? How will you do that differently next time? How will you advocate for yourself next time? And those were the weeks that I think were the most useful. And so I think if you're perfect through it, you almost don't get what you're supposed to out of it. And again, it's because it's not the food. It's and what's going on around it. And I have yet to find a client yeah. that's perfect. Right. Let me yeah. tell you. <laughs> Perfection's Brian, not yeah. a standard. Brian, did you experience no. that too, where you stumbled at times? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really, there were, there were tough weeks, mm -hmm. you know, uh, tough weeks where I thought I was doing great, but I didn't meet my goal or came close to, you know, missing it. And it, you, you reflect back, and it might not have been something that I did. It's just my body was going through some changes. And you don't want to put the accent on the scale. So many people right. stumble mm -hmm. because they're weighing themselves so incessantly, and they put the whole focus on this number. I tell people that that would make about as much sense as making trades in the stock market every hour because it changes. It, it's so fluid. You want to think about creating a system for yourself that creates momentum. You see, momentum allows for motivation. When we're making progress, we feel great. But progress isn't just measured on a scale. Progress can be, I went to a party and my best friend said to me, you look so great. Here, have a margarita. And I said, I'm choosing not to do that. And I didn't beat myself up after. I didn't feel like I was depriving myself. I felt good that I was standing my ground and saying, this is a boundary that I've drawn for myself because the goals I set, I've worked very hard to achieve. Mm -hmm. And getting to a point where you honor yourself that way is something that takes time. And this is a journey, as I said earlier, that's a lifetime journey. Mm -hmm. And while weight no longer is a distraction for these three, now they're much more in touch with mm -hmm. the other areas of their life that they can continue to work on and make progress toward uh, whatever new goals they set. Good point. Mm -hmm. Got to take a break. Stay with us. Back in a moment. Welcome back. We are talking about helping you accomplish your weight loss goals. And I have to tell you, Charles D'Angelo has a new book. Can you guys get a close-up shot on this? Wait, where do I need to sit it? Right here? 
Very good. Tell us about the book, Charles. <laughs> so my book, Inner Guru, is all about taking the disciplines that we learn through the weight loss process and applying it to other areas of life. Again, I look at it when a client comes to me as there's two levels. There's a superficial level, and by superficial, I don't mean insignificant, but I mean a presenting issue that is weight, right? But underneath that are issues relating to the relationship we have with ourselves, the relationship we have with others, whatever goals we have professionally, whatever we're working towards in terms of the quality of our life. Creating a lifestyle is really outstanding. So the book is taking the disciplines of, of focus, of concentration, of strategy, and then applying those to those other areas of life. Now, you have had an opportunity to work with a lot of people, including celebrities, you've sure. met presidents and all yes, that. Uh -huh. Tell me about that in, in this course of your journey. Are you working with celebrities also now? Well, I can never talk about anyone who hasn't publicly now as my work. Mm -hmm. So I can say this. I've had the privilege of helping people from all walks of life, from people that have participated in the Olympics to people that are on film, people in music. The thing that's most impactful and meaningful to me personally is the recognition that a person comes to when they see that once, what, what they once thought was impossible is possible. When they start to realize that, that's what makes me get out of bed every morning, is knowing that we can help people that once thought things that they've I believe have always deserved rather reach are within their reach and so it doesn't matter if it's a president if it's a, a celebrity that's kind of irrelevant in fact I try to leave that at the door of the office the reason I like to share the different things of, of the different folks I met is I started started from such a humble background my father was a janitor my mother and father neither of them had much education both sincere loving people but having come from that background and been privileged to help so many people and to arrive where I am today with all the grace that God's given me to get here, I try to share as much of that as possible, not to stroke my own ego, but to show people if Charles can do it, then why not you and why not now? And one thing for me is role models. I've always had role models. So I've always looked to certain people as examples. I think that's something all of us can do is you don't necessarily have to reach out to me. I'd be privileged to be your coach, but the biggest thing is finding someone in your own circle who's living the lifestyle you really deserve and you really want for yourself and starting to model their behaviors because all of us have access to strategy and strategy is a part of it. But again, you've got to have some accountability. You've got to have someone to give you a perspective. Tiger Woods has a coach. Okay, Michael Jordan had a coach. Are the coaches better than the players? Not usually. It's usually they are just able to offer a different perspective. And so I've always looked to certain people. You saw a picture of me with Arnold Schwarzenegger. My wife and I were invited to his home this past summer. I don't say that to impress anybody, but to impress upon you, you're talking to a, a kid that started making $6 an hour. And so if I could go from that to where I am now having an influence and impact on so many people, my mission is to show people what's possible, empower them with the strategies, the inspiration, the possibility, and then help them follow through and get there. And so, you're doing that. And thank oh, you so I appreciate much. it. Got to take a break. Final thoughts are up next. Welcome back. Time now for final thoughts. And Brian, how about if we start with you, sir? Your final thoughts on the I, subject. I just, I, I regret not making the phone call to Charles sooner. I, I, I think knowing how easy it was and how, how easy he made it, the plan was simple. I, I wish I would have done it many years ago. All right. Antonia, final thoughts, ma'am. I think find the time to put yourself on the list and keep yourself on that list. It's scary. You think other people won't make room for that, but they will, and they'll support you, and it'll feel good for doing it. Good point. Beth, final thoughts? My final thought is something a little different. Um, I haven't lost any weight. I released my weight because you can find things back that you lose. So my, my so you final, don't want to find that I don't want to find it back. So my final thought is words are important. Aw, awesome. Hello. Thank you all so much for being here. And of course, no, I didn't ask Charles for a final thought. He's been giving final thoughts throughout the program. So I'm gonna, but thank you so much my for being pleasure. here. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. And thank you for joining us this week for the Pulse of St. Louis. Remember, if you missed any part of the show, download the Pulse of St. Louis podcast in the iTunes or Google Play stores. And remember, for News 24-7, download the News 11 app. And for news during the week, be sure to watch News 11 at noon, 4, and 7. I will see you next time.